Specialist as an everyday problem solver who shows up every every day and works with the people of WNC to put practical solutions to the, to their everyday problems. You know, I've never asked any of the people I've worked with if there's a Democrat or if there's an Independent or if there's a Republican next to their name. I meet them where they're at. I show up and we move towards positive change. And that is what exactly you can expect from me when I win this race and I'm your next representative in Congress. Thank you. Uh, Jasmine, go ahead. Hi, everybody. I'm Jasmine Beach Ferrara. Really thrilled to be with you all tonight. Just to share a little bit about my qualifications and who I am. I'm a working mom. My wife, Megan, and I have three young children. I was raised by my mom, who is a single mom and a nurse went to community college to become a nurse and raised me on the values of service and faith. I'm honored to serve as a Buncombe County Commissioner in my second term right now. I've won two tough elections to hold that seat. In 2016, folks said I wasn't gonna win, and I did. In 2020, folks said I wasn't gonna win, and I beat a popular Republican by double digits. It's not just about winning tough elections, though. It's about what you do in office, and I'm proud to bring to this race a proven track record on exactly the policy issues that are front and center in the lives of folks in Western North Carolina right now. Expanding early childhood education, creating jobs and economic recovery, and responding to the crisis of the opiate addiction, ensuring people have access to health care. I'm also an ordained minister who's been doing rural organizing for the last 10 years across WNC and across Hi. the Deep South, and I bring that orientation to this race as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jasmine. Katie. Hey y'all, my name is Katie Dean, and uh, what qualifies me to serve as your congressional representative, I'll keep it brief. I'm smart, I'm tough, I've got 20 plus years living as a working class, middle class American. I like to tell folks that I've got 10 years of age on Madison Cawthorn and 20 plus years of work experience. <laughs> my, uh, my background is in environmental engineering. And I've done infrastructure design for rural municipalities. My husband and I are also small business owners. We own an auto repair business. We're proud to put food on our table and pay our mortgage with skilled labor. We know how difficult it has become to survive a broken economy. As your representative, I strive to get rid of the legalized corruption that we have in our legislative policies. 
I look forward to the opportunity. Thank you. Josh? What qualifies me to represent NC11 is you know, my history of service to my community and to my country. You know, I served as an infantryman in the Army for eight years, and I did two combat tours in Iraq. And then when I came home after that, I saw that there were issues here that needed to be dealt with. So I, I volunteered with Team Rubicon and helped, uh, helped after Hurricane Michael in Florida. They deployed me down there, helped with damage assessment. I also got my wildland firefighter certification through them. And I even helped out several, uh, uh, a population of homeless female veterans in Henderson County with Aura Homes. I think that's important. I think that anyone that's going to represent, lead, or serve a community needs to be willing to roll up their sleeves and get down with the community and actually be a part of it. That's what I think. The other thing is the depth and breadth of my experience is what's going to make me the best suited to, to be able to win in, in the general election. On top of that, my education and my background and, and the study and execution of political science, that's what's going to help me along with my, you know, my common sense Hi. approach to people and working on projects and being able to work across the aisle. Thank you very much. Eric? Thank you. Thank you uh, for the folks that organized uh, bringing school supplies for the kids. That's fantastic. Um, I've done the work. I've done the job. Uh, as a pastor, uh, as a, a principal at an my old elementary school, um, as a chaplain with the police department, I've bridged those gaps. Uh, in our community. At a time when our community was on the brink of being divided, I brought folks together. Credit credibility. Um, you know, when folks were reaching out, they reached out to me. Business leaders, elected officials, both local and state, faith leaders, they reached out to me to get my, uh, to get my advice, um, to get my opinion on things, and to get direction. They came to me, and I'm going to be a bridge builder. That's proven that I've done that. Half a dozen, uh, two dozen folks have reached out to me to say, Eric, I'm going to vote for you. I'm independent. I'm going to vote for you. We can bring folks together, and that's what I aim to do. Thank you. Chen, go ahead. Thank you. So my first qualification, I have the ability to connect with people. I know how to connect with them with our shared values, and that's important. We all share many of the same values, and we need to learn how to speak to each other about those values, share that commonality, and move forward. Secondly, I'm a proven leader. I have led in good and bad times. I understand what it means to make those tough decisions, those tough choices. And along with that, I understand how to work with experts, when to listen to them, and sometimes when not to listen to them, but always take in their expertise into consideration when making decisions. Very, very important that we listen to our experts. Our experts have literally saved hundreds of thousands of lives this year. And lastly, although I wasn't fortunate enough, I do believe I was smart enough to make Western North Carolina my home. Thank you. Okay, the second question, um, and I, I would uh, request that we hold our applause. Everybody has had a, an applause now, <laughs> so uh, we don't need to spend time with that, if that's okay with you all. The second question, Jay, you're going to go first this time. Uh, what do you think is the most harmful thing that our current representative has done to our district? So, the most harmful thing that our representative has done to this district is he has lied to his constituents. He is not a conservative. He's a fascist. He has modeled himself after Trump. He wants to keep us divided, fighting with ourselves, so that they can take advantage of their rigged system. What he does does not serve us, it only serves himself. And that is the biggest shame of his two-year tenure. Thank you. Eric? Well, he's turned his back on us, that's for certain. Um, we're the, you know, he can't advocate for us, right? He, he has a vote, but he, he lost his voice. 
He's lost credibility amongst his peers. He's lost credibility in, in the House. And if we need something here in Western North Carolina, guess what? We don't have a voice in somebody that can represent us. Um, we're called to serve and not to be served. And it's important that we have somebody there to represent our mountain values. A handshake is as good as a written contract. Your word is your bond. You work hard for a, a day's pay, you, you get that day's pay. And it's important that we have somebody who's going to stand for us. Thank you. Josh? I believe it's easy. I think it's his vanity. You know, Madison Cawthorn has focused since day one on chasing celebrity instead of actually working for the people of Western North Carolina. You know, he was part of that treasonous insurrection. He was up there trying to get famous. And he's up on the roof smoking cigars. And then he's, he's out doing his husbandly duties instead of actually being a representative for this community. He's chasing around Donald Trump because he wants to be famous. He wants to earn a quick buck. All the while, every single one of us is suffering because we're not getting the necessary things that we need done back here. I mean, all you have to do is look at his record for voting. Out of the 500 plus Congress representatives that we have in D.C., he has missed the most votes in Congress. That is unacceptable. Thank you. Katie? I'd uh, start with the fact that he propagates the big lie. And he helped incite a violent insurrection and attack on our capital. And then you could continue into his voting record and the fact that he voted no against the Violence Against Women's Act. There's bipartisan agreement on that. As he throws, I call, I call Cawthorn a smoke and mirror politician. He throws up smoke and mirrors and he runs on hate, fear mongering, and vitriol. And that is all he has. We defeated McCarthyism in the 50s, and I think we can do it again in this next election cycle. Thank you. Jasmine? Cawthorn's harmed our district in all kinds of ways. He's treating his job as a reality TV show that's about getting attention and actually representing the people of the district. Whether it's to incite an insurrection, daily extremism and division, going up for votes, voting against things like the American Rescue Plan, which will deliver life-changing results to Western North Carolina. He fails at a basic level to understand the profound responsibility he has. On the other hand, I present a stark contrast to Madison Cawthorn. I'm an elected official, and every single day I am out there serving the constituents that I've been honored to represent, and that's on the critical issues that are facing families across Western North Carolina right now. Making sure we can build a strong economy out of this pandemic creating early childhood education opportunities, making sure people have access to the health care that they need in response to the opiate crisis. It's about more than this, though. It's about coming together around the shared values of love, of hope, of empathy, of belonging and connection in a time of division. And it's also about the kind of campaign where we talk about what Democrats are for. Thank you. Well, thank you. The opposition represents everything that is wrong with our government system. He, as my colleagues have mentioned, he lies, he stokes fear, he pours gasoline on the flames of division. But probably like you guys, I do not like even reading or talking about him. And this election isn't even about him. And, and it's not about me, and it's not about my colleagues. It's about the people of WNC and making sure that we can stand up to Russia and China, making sure that we have safety in our community and in our streets, making sure that people have access to health care and mental health care, and making sure that we all have the dignity of work and a living wage. And that is exactly what I will fight for in Congress. Okay, thank you. The, the last one minute question, uh, we'll start with Josh and we'll come this way and then bounce over to Bo with the, uh, in that order. Here's the question. We haven't held this seat since 2010. What makes your approach to winning different than, mo than previous candidates? Look, I want to say that, you know, outside of having a, you know, a smart, a strong candidate, retail politics is important out here in the rural districts. On top of that, you need to have smart and solid data analysis. So, you know, um, our approach is building a multifaceted communication strategy, one which targets and brings out our, our base, makes sure that our base comes out, 
even on the in the midterm election, and it also targets those that vote regularly. And then the, the purpose of this is for these two sets of voters is to give them consistent, streamlined communication and make sure that they get mobilized throughout this district and know how important it is that we get rid of Madison Costum. So ultimately, at the, at the end of the day, it's going to be about community. That's what it's about. Aaron? Well, thank you again for that question. It's going to come down to building a broad coalition. Um, you know, we're going to need in the independent vote. We're going to need some Republicans to, uh, to come over to our side as well, and that's what I've been doing. I've been contacted over the last couple of weeks by two dozen folks that says, Eric, we're going to vote. For, I'm going to vote for you. I had a fella come to me in the post office and says, I've been a Republican all my life, but I'm switching to independent so I can vote for you in the primary. I'm going to do that, and I'm going to vote for you in the general. And there's a reason why the last Democrat to hold this seat has endorsed me, okay? Now, we don't agree on everything, but there's something that we can agree on, that come November, I can defeat Madison Cawthorn. Thank you. Jay? I think I'll have a seat thing down by now. <laughs> All right, so this is a difficult question for me to answer. We've had some great candidates in the past. It's really hard to understand why they haven't been elected. But... What sets me apart, I believe, is my message, is that together we can. Together, we can go, we can vote, and we can have our voice heard. Because the most powerful person in our district, in our county, in our state, in our nation, is the voter. And I understand that. And I believe that together, we can show up, we can vote, we can get that fascist, out of office, and we can make a better life for all of us. Mo? The Democrats have run safe candidates in the past, and we've lost, and the Democrats are notorious for running uh, candidates that they think it's their turn to run. I don't care about endorsements from politicians who got us into this place in the first place, and I certainly don't care about endorsements from politicians who are ineffective at their job currently. And I think that we need a candidate who can build a broad coalition across all, all party lines. Just as Eric said, we're going to need to pull in those Republicans, those Biden Republicans, those independents. I've already been doing that work with the people for the past 15 years. And winning an election in the most liberal part of Buncombe County isn't going to win us the election in the 17 counties of the district. We have to have a candidate that is a millennial that can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the opposition and will not back down. Look, um, we need to get to work. We have time. Thank you. Don't y'all love me? Yes, you're good, Nancy. <laughs> you're, you're very good at your job. Um, let's be real. There's some folks who say that a Democrat cannot win this seat. I don't believe them, and I don't think you do either. And I want to talk to you about how we can win this seat together. The first prong of this is organizing, early, often, and everywhere. On your chair, you'll find an invitation to sign up to join us for a day of action on August 14th, where we'll be contacting voters across the entire district, and we'll be organizing throughout the duration across all 17 counties in District 11. We'd love to have you out there with us. Second prong is holding Cawthorn accountable, telling the truth and shining a very bright spotlight on his hypocrisy, his lies, and his extremism. You can also do that while having fun. You're also going to find an invite to join us for a family-friendly game of mini golf that we're hosting this Saturday, while Cawthorn will be up in New Jersey at a $50,000 ahead fundraiser with Trump. As we shine, hold him accountable, we're also about celebrating Western North Carolina values and the things Western North Carolina folks actually do on a Saturday. Another piece of this is building the kind of campaign that can win, and we've been doing that since day one, whether it's the fundraising side of the house or the organizing side of the house. We'd love for you to join us as we organize to win. Thank you. And Kate. Oh. When you look at the metrics of our district from 2010 to now, they've changed dramatically. In terms of how much we've been gerrymandered, the district map will be different again in 2022. We look at voter turnout across the board has increased, has increased since 2012. And 
let's be realistic about what we're up against. This is an uphill battle every single step of the way. And I do think that the path to victory in, the, in North Carolina's 11th is a razor thin margin that we can win. Part of defeating Cawthorn is gonna be selecting a candidate who is authentic and genuine and can sincerely buck the status quo to bring honorable representation to our district. I do think that every candidate that stepped onto the stage is qualified and y'all have a difficult choice. Part of this election is about what you can do to serve and then who can go on to unseat Cawthorn. I do not envy the decision that you have to make but to unseat Cawthorn, we're gonna have to pull people off the couch and you're gonna need to send a candidate who has the youthfulness and enthusiasm to do so. Thank you. That's the end of the speed round. And uh, you can all imagine if you were pressed with some of those questions, how at least maybe I should speak for myself, I would stammer and stutter and uh, well, uh, yeah. Let's give them all a round of applause for what they did. Okay, our, our next uh, section is um, uh, each candidate has 10 minutes to talk about their platform and then they will take audience questions. I, I, that means uh, the candidate can either speak for 10 minutes using up the whole time or they can speak for five minutes and take audience questions then. It's up to them. But uh, they um, uh, did draw names, and Bo was the first one to go. So. And I will hold up two fingers when there's two minutes time. Do you have an idea? Thank you. So um, I think I'll, I'll just speak for two or three minutes, and then I'll, I'm happy to take a audience questions. I just want to thank uh, John um, again for organizing this and all your leadership here in Madison County. Maggie, um, uh, thank you for everything that you've done as well and working with my team. I know it's hard to kind of crowd all of the candidates together, so good work on that. Jim, thank you so much for moderating and thank you for having me on your show. It was an honor to be on there. My pleasure. Um, so, and Thank you all, and it is very inspiring to see a bunch of Democrats together in a rural county, and this is how we win elections. We come up, we talk about the hard issues, and we, we um, um, do, and we figure out solutions to those issues. And I'm a licensed clinical social worker, I'm a licensed clinical addiction specialist, I'm not a polished politician, so I'm a little nervous, so you know, forgive me if I stumble a little bit. But I get up every morning and I help people put practical solutions to the everyday problems. And I really do think we need a candidate that is an everyday working person who, um, who is just like you and I. You know, I was frustrated with government on both sides of the aisle, Republicans and Democrats. I was an independent, you know. Um, I registered as a Democrat because my values align more with the Democrats, but I was frustrated with both sides. And probably like you, I was not going to sit pacing, sit, spend my time pacing in my house being angry about it. I decided I'd do something about it and I was gonna run for Congress. I kept having wonderful ideas about a lot of different things. Um, housing, um, addiction, mental health, safety in our community and streets. I'd write our state representatives. I'd write our city leaders. I'd write our county commissioners. I'd hear deaf ears, I'd hear nothing. And so I kept hearing, you know, you got to find the political will, Bo. You just got to find the political will. And I said, I will be that will. And that's why I'm running. My campaign is three pillars, safety in our community, in our streets, the dignity of work, and affordable health care and mental health care for everyone. I am a licensed therapist. I run a small private practice. I work on a busy psychiatric unit. I'm a law enforcement consultant. I train law enforcement officers at mental health and crisis intervention. I know what it's like to meet people where it's at. I know what it's like to work with Republicans. Um, I come from a Republican family. My dad was in the military. I was born Reese Air Force Base in Lubbock, Texas, and traveled all over the world until I've lived, until I made WNC home now for over 20 years. I encourage you to um, reach out to us. I am not a fly-in candidate. I want to, if you want coffee, if you want to have dinner, if you want to Zoom chat, if you want to ask any questions, um, I'd be happy to speak with you. Check us out at bohess.com. You can also email me at uh, bhess 
at bohessforuscongress.com. And if you want to shoot me a text or a phone call, my number is 828-423-6484. And um, like I said, um, I'm in this to win it, and we will make it happen. And I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you. Questions, anyone? Don't be shy. I have a question for all of your candidates. I'd like to know how you stand in support of our law enforcement officers and our military. Yes, ma'am. So I am for law enforcement. I fully support law enforcement. In fact, calls to defund the police hit on deaf ears with me. When we defund the police, what happens is the most vulnerable of us that is the LGBTQ populations, the homeless population, black, indigenous, people of color populations actually suffer. I don't know what kind of privilege people have and are living in that they are calling to defund law enforcement. Law enforcement is actually one of the critical backbones of a modern society that we have. If we look at other countries where law enforcement is failing, it is complete chaos. Now. I don't believe that demonizing law enforcement is the issue, and that's part of the reason why I'm running for Congress. There are federal laws on the books that are unjust that we can change at a federal level that will have the ripple effect of making the criminal legal system more just. As far as the military, I'm a 100% um, a supporter. My father is a veteran. I spent my life traveling from Air Force Base to Air Force Base. And so I fully support our military in making sure that they are fully funded and as well as our veterans in making sure that they have full access to health care and mental health care and that honor, other than honorably and dishonorably discharged veterans have their cases reviewed and they are incorporated into the system because often those individuals lost their military service due to a mental health or an addiction issue. And so if we can get them back into services, we can maybe um, provide a better life for our constituents. Remembering that the Constitution grants Congress the powers for to protect the general welfare of the public. And that is exactly what I plan on doing, making sure we have a strong national defense is number one, and making sure we have safety and community in our streets, which is my number one pillar, is number two. Questions? Yes, ma'am. Hi. Yeah, how do you feel about um, student loan forgiveness? I absolutely agree with student loan forgiveness, especially if you're going into a sector where you're giving back into the community. I think that as it is right now, uh, student loans are, are there's a lot of predatory lending. I I think I agree with free two year uh, college and tuition, or maybe not even a two year, but free training for the industries that I will bring to WNC for the people of 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 this district. Um, I have student loans, and so um, while I do think that you know I should pay into it. We need, we need a robust system to give back. Nobody should be strapped with debt for going to school and making a better life for them and their family in the best, wealthiest country in the world. That should not be the case. And we have to remove that burden because what's happening is it's having a ripple effect on our economy and young people who are saddled with these debts are not buying into the housing market, are not starting families. We have a drop-off in children that are being born in this country. This is more than just a, a student debt issue. It is a whole economic issue that we need to address. And having the big banks hold a ball and chain over our young people is wrong. There was a question back there. Terry? Yes. Um, if you get to Congress and the filibuster is still in place, what do you think about that? Thank you. Um, that will be something that I'll have to address at that moment. Um, you know, I would like to see government and Congress working in a functional manner, and that's part of the reason why I'm running. Um, so I think at that moment I would I would take take a look and see what's going on politically at that time. I think the arguments against removing the filibuster are kind of filled with fallacies. Um, um, I think um, Kirsten. Um, over in Arizona, she did her best in her uh, uh, Washington Post editorial. But again, uh, though it didn't make sense. I think there's better reasons to, to keep it. And that's just that is having faith in our system of government. 
if the other side continues to not play nice, um, I think there's a time and place to show your fangs. And I think there's a time and place to, to, to step up. And um, so it depends on what's going on politically at that time. Is that the time then? No, go ahead. One minute. Sorry. Go ahead. One minute. Jerry, go ahead. Oh, no, she had a question. Let her go. Oh, go ahead. Yes. Uh, how do you feel about Medicare for all? Thank you. So I 100% believe that health care is a right and that everybody should have access to health care and mental health care. The issue with Medicare for All, though, is that if we pass a bill with that, it would be a complete failure because we don't have the health care infrastructure even to uh, treat the people who have insurance right now. So there are actually uh, better fixes that we can do in the meantime that I uh, support while working towards you know, a full um, uh, public option. And some of those things are supporting our federally qualified health care centers, making sure that psychosocial issues are billable with insurance, increasing team-based care, increasing mental health parity, um, and making sure that people have access to that the same they would with primary care. These are things that we can do in the short term. We just need an advocate and someone in the healthcare field to understand those interest keys to, to move those policies forward. You know, I don't wait for things to be popular. I would, I, to put out a statement, I've been in this seat. But I really want to talk about my approach as a policymaker with a proven track record around exactly the issues that are front and center in the lives of working families across all 17 counties of Western North Carolina as we work together, not just to pull out of one of the most monumental crises we've ever faced, but also to find our way forward in a time of great division and a time, frankly, of great pain. The approach I've taken on county commission has, been, has started with listening carefully and deeply to all of my constituents, folks who voted for me, but also folks who voted against me, because that's what this kind of service and leadership is about. And it's been about building tables and bridges and trust and relationship to address exactly the issues that are hitting home for folks across our community. That's meant working in partnership with folks in recovery, with parents who have experienced the heartbreak of losing a child to an opiate overdose, with folks in law enforcement to figure out some of the most innovative and compassionate responses to the opiate epidemic that are happening across the country and are happening right here in Western North Carolina. That's meant helping to lead the charge on rolling out one of the most ambitious plans to expand access to early childhood education that's happening in North Carolina, and doing so with bipartisan and unanimous votes on a bipartisan county commission. That is my orientation to this, and I bring to that orientation a background as an organizer. I've spent the last 10 years traveling across the South, including across Western North Carolina, working on some of the toughest issues out there, LGBTQ issues in the South, issues that folks are sometimes even scared to talk about, and doing it from an approach that starts with listening, that starts with respect, treating everyone with empathy, and believing that we can find a way forward even around those things where it might seem like there's not a clear path. That's the orientation that I take to this. And the other piece that's so critical to talk about each and every time we talk about why this race matters is the values that we bring into politics. The campaign that we're building is about love and hope and empathy, and that is extended to each and every person in Western North Carolina. No exceptions. The campaign we're building is about organizing in every single county and every single precinct across the district, making sure that folks who haven't heard from Democrats perhaps in quite some time are having conversations and that those conversations start with us listening. The campaign we're building is talking about what Democrats stand for, universal pre-K, health care for all, jobs you can raise a family on, responding to the crisis of climate, climate change, addressing racial justice, addressing economic justice, and perhaps above all of that, finding a way forward together to heal our communities, to help families recover from the crisis of this time, and to create together the country that America is ready to be and needs to be for all of us. Our invitation to you is to join us in this movement. I want to ask you, raise your hand if someone's told you that a Democrat can't win this race. Raise your hand if you believe a Democrat can win this race. Okay, we have that in common, all of us. And I want to say one thing here, which is that one way we're going to win is being in lockstep as a party. 
and having a big tent that everyone is welcome to come to, regardless of their political affiliation or how they're registered. We build a big table and we keep the doors open and we always make room at the table for people who are ready to sit down and find common ground around the kind of shared values that really matter in people's lives here in the mountains. That's the kind of campaign we're building, it's the kind of movement we're building together, and it's what we'd love you to join us in, whether it's at the day of action we're having, the mini golf party we're having, or any of the organizing we'll be doing across the district throughout the duration of the campaign. We're in this to win, not just to defeat Cawthorn, but to deliver to Western North Carolina the leadership that we need and deserve in Washington. With that, I'll close my remarks and open it up for any questions. I'd love, ma'am, if it's okay to begin with yours after I take a sip of water. What was your name? Diane. It's nice to meet you. You asked about uh, support for law enforcement and military. This is a really critical issue, and as I listen to friends of mine who are in law enforcement, I hear so much trouble and frustration in their voices as they talk about long overtime shifts, as they talk about being called to all kinds of situations like mental health crises and situations that um, go far beyond what we, what we used to ask of folks in law enforcement, for instance. I believe that law enforcement has to be at the table and a critical voice at the table as we figure out how to build communities that are safe for everyone. And when I listen to folks in law enforcement, I hear them saying, one, we need better pay and we need better benefits. We're first responders, we're under extraordinary stress, including mental health stress, and many of us have to work second jobs or do double duty doing private events, for instance, to keep a roof over our head or make sure our family has what it needs. So we have to address that at the local, state, and federal level, in my opinion. We have to make sure law enforcement has access to the mental health that they need. Folks I know in law enforcement are eager to be at the table and architects of how law enforcement evolves in the 21st century to respond to the challenges of this moment. They want to be having conversations about racial justice issues, about the opiate epidemic, and about how we keep communities that are truly safe. Um, turning to your question about how we support military, I want to give credit to uh, Mr. Hess, who does a lot of work with veterans, and we have veterans here in, uh, in both Jay and Josh, and I want to thank you all for your service. It's really critical that we lift up the experience of veterans, especially when folks come home from deployment, and for, of their families, especially when they're in deployment, and thinking particularly about the mental health issues, yes, but also housing uh, and how folks access affordable housing and re-enter the workforce and making sure there are specific targeted programs for vets, whether it's veterans housing, there's some incredible models out there, or whether it's specific career training programs to make sure that the incredible skills people developed while they were enlisted can translate into 21st century economy, whether it's green jobs, advanced manufacturing, going back to school to get another degree or certificate. Thank you for the great question. Anybody else? Terry? I'd like to know, um, if you think that, what do you think about the possibility of increasing the Supreme Court and should they have term limits? That's an excellent question. I'm going to be honest with you, that's one I'm reading up on a lot. I'm married to a lawyer and I have been trained in needing to know the details, especially when it's something as critical as thinking about the most powerful judiciary in the country. Um, so I'd love to get back to you on that if that's okay. Um, and it's something I'm actively researching right now and following closely as the debate unfolds. I will say in closing though, there's a lot that's incredibly critical that's coming before our current court um, and pivot into talking about some of these issues for a moment, if I might. Um, you know, whether it's um, issues around uh, women's health care and reproductive justice issues, or whether it's um, issues around civil rights issues and voting rights, you know, it's, it's critically important that we have a court that is truly responsive, not just to the language of the Constitution, but to the ways that our country is evolving. So let me research and get back to you. Great question. We've got two minutes. Two minutes. Yes. Good. How do you feel about increasing the minimum wage? Fully support it. Folks need to be able to earn the kind of jobs that you can raise a family on and you can build a future on. Um, I'm proud that our campaign is paying uh, $15 an hour or more for interns and for staff and I support $15 an hour as a minimum wage moving forward. Um, I hear so many stories of struggle and so many stories of people trying to figure out how to piece together multiple jobs so they can figure out how to pay rent, how to have some kind of health care, and how to think about what the future holds for them. That's gotta change. 
And we are in a critical moment as we recover from this pandemic where I think we can put questions like this on the table. And we're seeing the impact of things, for instance, like the child tax credit, right? Families all across Western North Carolina just received a couple hundred dollars in their bank accounts that could go immediately to rent, to diapers, to daycare, to healthy food for their families. We know that when folks who are earning the least and often working the hardest get a little bit of a bump, it improves their health, it improves their performance at work, it helps open up other kinds of opportunities for them and their children, and it helps us build stronger communities and ultimately a stronger country. Oh, so, time. Uh -huh. <laughs> I want to be respectful of that. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Jasmine. Katie? <clears throat> Okay. Ten minutes, yeah. Ten. Do you want this? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Hey, y'all. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? My husband and I own a small business, and when we started the business, we did not have much to go on. And we've built the shop from one bay to five bays, and we've created a few good jobs in our local economy along the way. It's been an uphill battle every single step of the way. And we've lived a life as working and middle-class Americans. And we've seen firsthand how difficult it has become to survive a broken economy. My background is in environmental engineering, as I said. After school, I went straight to work and I did infrastructure design for rural municipalities. Water lines, sewer lines, plant work. I've stood shoulder to shoulder with the contractors, the electricians, the hardworking people that maintain our communities and provide essential services like access to clean drinking water. We've put together a working class platform for a working class district. And I'm just gonna take the opportunity to bump through them and then y'all can ask some questions. Broadband and infrastructure. I don't think I need to say it, but I will. We need universal broadband yesterday. Our district is 53% rural. It is also inexcusable that we have crumbling infrastructure across our country. And to, and to Mr. Hess's point about China, for every dollar that the United States spends in infrastructure investment, China is spending four to five dollars. The economy. Addressing a broken and faltering economy is the heart and soul of our campaign. During my lifetime, the working and middle class have been undercut in every single capacity of the word. And we know that our legislative policies have been turned upside down and put us in a race to the bottom to benefit a select few. It's a positive feedback loop for them and a negative feedback loop for us. We see what's happening. We have to stand up and say something and do something about it. Education. Every single teacher that I'm friends with in Western North Carolina's 11th district works a second job to make ends meet. We know that this is inexcusable. Additionally, every single child, regardless of their parents' income and socioeconomic status, deserves the opportunity at an early age to build the fundamental blocks that they need to support a life of learning. We know that it is critical for a child to learn to read before the age of six. We have to have universal pre-K. Energy in the environment. The climate crisis is here. It's not even on our doorstep. We are living it. We are currently living the climate crisis and I ache to have a representative who understands not only the complexities of the climate crisis, but the urgencies of it. I've seen firsthand in my career where protecting environmental health go hand in hand with protecting public health. Those two things are synonymous. And when you do those things, you also create living, working wage, employment, and job opportunities in your immediate community, including your rural communities. Healthcare. This one's, this healthcare is personal for me. Who, quick show of hands. Is it personal for you too? Does everybody have a healthcare story that they're, they're frustrated with in terms of maintaining their access to social security or their children wanting to switch jobs and they can't change their careers because they might lose their health insurance or basing their entire career based on their access to health insurance? We have got to untangle corporate greed from our healthcare industry and we can start with holding pharmaceutical CEOs accountable for driving a huge wedge into our healthcare industries and lower the cost of life-saving prescription medication. Social diplomacy is the sixth point on our platform. The world is a dangerous place. There's no denying that. We can solve our nation's toughest issues 
immigration, the gun violence epidemic that we have in our country, and protect our access to the ballot and our right to vote with forward-thinking, level-headed leadership. While corporate CEOs have driven a wedge to one of the largest income and wealth disparity gaps that we've seen in our lifetime, they purchase representatives to do their bidding for them, including our very own smoke and mirror politician, Cawthorn. And wouldn't it be nice if we sent somebody to DC when they came and knocked on our door and they said, how much does your vote cost? We told them that we're not for sale. And this, this campaign and what we have to offer is, is about what we have to offer. Sorry, it's, um, it's authentic and genuine leadership. It's very simple in that capacity. This Democratic primary race is trying to answer the question about who can go on to unseat Madison Cawthorn. Who's tough enough to go up against them and who's smart enough to win? When my husband and I uh, decided to start a business, I left full-time employment in environmental remediation and compliance to work at the family business to help get things going as we brought on more employees. And in making that decision, I sacrificed our access to affordable health care. I then broke my collarbone as an uninsured patient. And I had two surgeries, one to install hardware into my shoulder, and I did the second surgery without general anesthesia, just to save $15,000 in healthcare costs. I like to tell people that I'm working class tough because I cannot afford to be anything else. And what's frustrating is we know it doesn't have to be like this. My healthcare story is not unique to me. It is uniquely American. We are the working class that Madison Cawthorn claims to represent, and we know he doesn't have our back. With that, I would love to open it up and answer any questions you may have. Wendy, right? Yes, it's Wendy. Uh, so I'd already asked Bo about uh, Medicare for all, but how do you see that and uh, do you support it? Yeah, I am for whatever, whatever health policy that we implement to get the most people, the most access to affordable health care as quickly as possible. And so I'm, I'm not really against any given policy um, as it comes to achieving our objective and how that can be achieved. I will be honest that stepping into this political climate within the next two years, I don't see Medicare for all passing. I think that the most, it, the most radical things we can do, the most efficient things we can do is to shore up the issues and the coverage gap that we have with the HCA. We can expand Medicaid to our rural regions. We can lower the qualifying age for Medicare. We can include dental, vision, and hearing in Medicare. We can do those things. I think those are achievable in the, in the climate that we have immediately uh, while we start to untangle the corporate greed that we have in our healthcare industry. So I'm, I'm not opposed to it, uh, but I'm, I'm for whatever, whatever works and serves the people in terms of access to healthcare. Thank you. Uh, Katie, how will you respond uh, when you will be called a radical uh, socialist who hates America. Right. I've already been called a communist. Um, I, you know, I, I think that we need to square up as a party. We, do, we need to square up to the socialism. And part of that is messaging. And, um, you know, investing in social programs is not socialism. Uh, look at the infrastructure plan that is on the table that, that we so desperately need. Uh, it'll cost a few trillion dollars. The price tag is yet to be determined. Uh, and, uh, you know, that is not, I, I don't know what to say other than it's just not socialism. There was one in the back. How do you feel about the Green New Deal? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I think we need it. I think that since the, the first New Deal was passed, we have watered it down and taken the, its power away. And, uh, I have some caveats about the Green New Deal, one of them largely being the expectation about moving to renewables and the infrastructure to achieve that. And I say that as somebody who's sincerely concerned with our carbon use in, on the global stage. Uh, they have a large percentage of it dedicated to hydropower, and my husband and I are both outdoor adventure athletes. I'm a whitewater kayaker and a mountain biker, and I've seen... Uh, what happens when you dam rivers uh, inside the United States and in countries like Ecuador and Costa Rica and other other countries and different economies? And the impact can be devastating. I'm, I'm so one of my larger concerns with the Green New Deal is uh, just some nuanced things associated with with hydropower expansion in the United States. 
and if our elected officials are being realistic in that capacity. Any other questions? We, or go ahead. Um, in order to be medicine, you're going to have to get the vote out. What's your, what's your plan to get people out to the polls? Good question. And uh, I'm going to answer it very quickly because I did not answer the police question at the beginning. I'm very sorry. It just comes down to organizing and and mobilizing the folks in, in various capacities. Uh, my background in, in engineering, I'm pretty well organized, especially mentally, and having a, a large, broad network. And as a 35-year-old outdoor adventure athlete with ties to this region for the last 15 plus years, I have friends in Franklin, I have friends in Cherokee County, uh, and we're small business owners in our local community. We have a broad network to mobilize the vote. I do want to take my last 45 seconds or so because I forgot to answer the police and military question. Very simply, we'll say, I, is it time? Uh, I support our troops, and I think that we ask way too much of our police officers who are underfunded and under-resourced. We need to increase pay and provide them the resources, the training, and the tools necessary so that they can intersect their communities in a productive and efficient and humane manner. Uh, I, I've been pulled over and a lot of them have trauma. They need trauma training as part of their job function. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's three of the uh, longer answers. Let's all just take about 20 seconds and stand up and uh, move our legs around and we'll uh, get back to the others. <laughs> How's it going? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, folks, we're uh, going to finish up with mm -hmm. the last three long answers here. Before we get to the, uh, the speed dating, as it's been called. Okay, uh, for uh, 10 minutes, uh, Josh Renelard has the uh, floor. And Josh, you can use all 10 minutes of talking, or you can take questions. You don't have to take questions, but it's up to you. So, good evening. You know, I, I learned early that life is a fight. Yeah, I think, yeah, right. Yeah. You want the mic? Okay. Yeah, we're recording. Can you hear me? <laughs> I learned early that life is a fight. You know, I, I grew up in Wilmington, and I was, I was born in Goldsboro. But before that, I had a, a pretty troubled childhood. I was in the foster care system, and I bounced around from family to family until about the age of four, when my grandparents were able to actually adopt me. You see, my... Uh, my, grand, my grandfather was uh, a retired uh, uh, airman, and he was working in the State Department. And so he and my grandmother were actually sort of just looking forward to traveling around the world and, and you know, living out the golden years and having a good time. But I needed them. So they took a lot of huge sacrifices and brought this angry, troubled little four-year-old into their life 
to give him a good life. Um, at the age of 24, I decided to join the military. I decided that I, I wanted to have the, uh, the honor of fighting for and defending our country. So I joined as an infantryman, and I did eight years, and I did two combat tours in Iraq. Now I'm fighting a completely different fight. I'm, I'm running for Congress. And, you know, alongside me, as she's always been, is my wife, Rhiannon. And we've, we've been blessed in Canton. We've made a home in Canton. We've been blessed with two miraculous, amazing little girls. Guinevere is three years old. We just, we just put her in daycare. And Eowyn is two. Yeah, I'm kind of a nerd. I like Lord of the Rings. So I named my daughter Eowyn. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, she just turned two, and she's a little terror around the house, but it's, it's amazing. And, and I'll tell you, yes, I'm running for Congress, and I have two little ones under the age of four, and no, my life is not quiet at the house, but honestly, I prefer it that way. You know, uh, this, this campaign, I'm, I'm deal we're, we're dealing with someone who should just absolutely not be in office. And, and for me, January 6th was the day that I decided that I needed to get involved. You know, I was sort of milling about the house, watching TV, and then I look up and I see Madison Cawthorn up there telling people that there's a lot of fight in this crowd, and he likes it, and let's go ahead and take our nation's capital. I'll tell you what, I lost several battle buddies when I was deployed. I lost a really good friend of mine back home due to PTSD. And every single one of these soldiers, and myself, we all accepted the consequences to our actions to defend this country. So watching that little turd, excuse me, go up there on stage, and treat it like a reality TV show I could not stand by anymore. That was the line in the sand. When Madison Cawthorn was elected, he was supposed to fix our broken system in DC. That's what he was elected for. Instead, what has he done? He's gone up there on Fox News chasing celebrity a la Trump, and he's posting videos about himself, smoking cigars, you know, as I said before, doing his husbandly duties. Nothing he has done has been for the service of Western North Carolina. However, there is life there. There is life in DC. I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it. We're, we, we have, we've, we've, we've pivoted. We have, we have life in DC. But Western North Carolina is my home. My heart is here. And I'm a fighter. I've grown up fighting. And so I'm going to fight to make Western North Carolina thrive on health care, jobs, and education. Because we deserve a fighter who will actually go to the wall for us, fight for us, to give us the things that we actually need. And quit playing around, chasing celebrity, and just overall ignoring us. So, as I said, you know, I've, I've, grown, up as, I've grown up a fighter. My whole life has been a fighter. I welcome it. It's normal to me. But I'm a Democrat running in Western North Carolina. Okay? And just like liberating villages in Iraq, it can't be done alone. So I need your help. And I would be absolutely honored to have you fight alongside me as we take back our district. I want to thank you guys so much. I look forward to your, your questions. Uh, Josh, one question given to me. How will you be unconditionally positive influence? How will you be an unconditionally positive influence representing a party that cares about the well-being of all Americans within an attack-oriented political environment? How will you be positive in an attack-oriented political environment? I love that question because it's it's important, right? You're, we're, we're going to be faced with constant negative attacks from the right, constantly. They want to call us socialists. We're, we're, we're tearing up the country. We're indoctrinating with liberal indoctrination in our schools, you know, whatever, whatever the case is. I think, and I've, I've learned this when I was in the Army. I learned this when I played football, when I wrestled. I learned this just throughout my life period and when I volunteered. You need to either put up or shut up. So if you want to do good in your community and you want to be a positive impact in your community, you have to be different than what you see. You have to be out there engaged in the community, rolling up your sleeves. I did that when I, uh, uh, a couple years ago when I moved here. I helped out Mountain True. I helped them 
uh, stake the banks, clean the river of Mud Creek. As I said, I helped out Aura Holmes, homeless female veterans, which is quickly on the rise in Henderson County. I got down and helped them out because I could not stand to see my fellow sisters in arms in trouble. I went to Brevard and I helped build a skate park out there because I wanted to help with the kids that needed somewhere to go. As I said before, if you're a representative or if you claim that you want to represent somebody, if you claim that you want to lead people, if you claim that you want to serve a community, then get down on the ground where the rubber meets the road and help your community. That's how I think that we, be, we demonstrate a positive message. And uh, if I could just, it was it Pat? If I could answer the, the military and police question just real fast. Um, you know, I, I think that there is an issue with the amount of stress that our police force faces. I think that we put too much on our police force. So I think that, you know, why don't we remove some of the aspects that, uh, that, that, they're, that, they're, that they're faced with and make them their own departments and their own, in their own individual segments that they can, they can have their own uh, sovereignty and work, work their own problems. I think that what we should do is take the, uh, some of the issues with drug abuse, with opioid issues, and turn those, instead of criminal issues, turn those into the issues of rehabilitation. So people aren't afraid to go to the cops, or they're not afraid to step out their door and go, go seek help anymore. I think that's a big issue. And that sort of leads into the issue with, uh, with veterans. You know, I face that very personally. Um, one thing that the, that the Army does for veterans is it says, okay, you've got three weeks, you got three weeks, you're getting out of the Army. Fill out paperwork and get out. And then they just let you out. And you're, you, especially if you're an infantryman whose job, I'm pretty sure that you guys all understand what that means. There's not really much room for you out in the civilian sector. They train you to do one specific job, and then they just cut you loose out in the sector. They cut you loose out in the civilian sector. So there needs to be some way for military members to transition better out of the military. There needs to be some way for us to translate what we have as hard, soft skills when we get out into the job sector. So we don't feel a sense of loss. So we have a sense of mission still when we get back out to the world. So I think that's a very important thing that I definitely, absolutely want to address. Um, in regards to rural broadband, how, do you, how would you help Western North Carolina um, in that aspect? That's a good question. Uh, rural broadband, you know, it's, it's hard to set up rural broadband in a big mountainous rural district like Western North Carolina got mountains. I mean, I think Haywood County has the most mountainous peaks out of the entire Western North Carolina, I believe. That's hard. It's hard, to, it's hard to set up lines for rural broadband out there because unlike urban cities and so on, you can easily spread cable out and just, just be on your way. Out in mountains, it's difficult. I think what's necessary is investing, like everyone else has said here, is investing in a rural broadband system. One strategy that I've looked into is running cables, broadband cables along with TV cables up telephone poles, put out your, uh, your router or your, uh, or your modem or what have you on TV or on telephone poles, and then spreading it out to the local little areas around you. That's going to take some money. But I think that that's, that's what we need to do. Trying to bounce signals off of satellites is, I mean, I, I had Biosat for the longest time, and that thing, it's not, it's not fun by any stretch. <laughs> So you say you're a fighter. I'd just like to know what kind of experience you have building consensus with a wide range of people with whom you may not agree. One of my other, I, I guess it was a benefit of having lived with my grandparents, having raised with them around the world. I've, I've been able to see various, various communities, various different ways of living. On top of that, you know, I, I got my bachelor's degree in political science and philosophy. And one of the most important fundamental things in philosophy is being able to just listen to somebody, first and foremost. The reason we can't talk to one another is because we're talking at one another. Time. Oh. <laughs> All right, well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if they're going to be around after this, so your questions are not being answered, there's going to be plenty of other opportunities to do so. So they're not all going to run out of the door. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if, you didn't, if you didn't hear that, Nancy said that they're... The candidates will be here for a few minutes afterward if you want to get uh, personal with them and uh, talk in more detail. Eric? I'm getting ready. I, you know, <laughs> get over here quick. I know no. how, how quickly that does it pass, so I know how quickly it goes. My name is Eric Gash. 
I'm born and raised right here in this district. I'm the son of the soil, right here. Hendersonville, uh, about uh, 50 minutes away. I graduated from Hendersonville High School in 1988, where I was a three-sport athlete, football, basketball, and baseball. I was blessed enough to earn a football scholarship to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, uh, where Coach Brown, uh, Coach Mac Brown, who's back, Mac is back, um, uh, he was my coach coming in in 1988, so we uh, christened Chapel Hill together. Um, and he has uh, said that he would uh, you know, do a video, do something for me, so that's awesome. He's, he's a great guy. My wife is here, Katie Gash, of 25 years. When I, when I said I do, my IQ shot up. It was like, oh, yes, I did. <laughs> um, yeah, we have uh, three grown kids. Uh, Keelan, our oldest kid, is, uh, just graduated from... North Carolina State University. I won't, we'll, we'll keep it moving. Uh, my second, our second son, he uh, is in, uh, yeah, environmental science. Jacob graduated from Western Carolina uh, this uh, just a few months ago, and our daughter Maya is a junior at North Carolina A and T State University. I am uh, presently the senior pastor at Speak Life Community Church. Uh, former principal at my old elementary school, Bruce Drysdale Elementary. Uh, I'm a police chaplain. Uh, so we're gonna, I'm going to talk about that. Uh, also a chaplain at the, with the Blue Ridge Prison and Jail Ministries over in Henderson County where we go in and, and talk to the inmates there. Um, I sit on the board of the Community Foundation at Henderson, of Henderson County, uh, the Juvenile Crime Prevention Council, and the newly formed uh, Diversity and Equity Advisory Committee with uh, the City of Hendersonville. I sit on that as well. So that's a lot. <laughs> it sounds like a lot. Why Congress? I've had that question time and time again. Why not something local? Why Congress? A little over a year ago, we saw a man murdered on TV. The world watched. And it was at that point I said, I've got to do something. I can no longer just sit idly by and do nothing. My mom didn't raise me that way. She said, if there's a need, Eric, you step up and you fill it. But I didn't quite know what I was going to do. <laughs> But I knew I had to do something. And I was talking to folks, folks that I knew and loved. And, uh, and I was like, man, listen, I got to do something. And they were encouraging me to run for office. I said, you've lost your mind. No, it doesn't make any sense. But the more I kept talking and I kept encouraging other people to run, no, you run. I'll support you. Eric, you need to run. So I had a heart to heart. My wife and I talked and, and really prayed about it. Three things came up. One, service. Continued service. It's an opportunity to serve our community, serve our district. Right? There's a leadership deficit right now in our district, in District 11, Western North Carolina. There's a leadership deficit. Instead of uh, wanting to make a difference, I said, I want to be a difference. I'm not just going to sit by and do nothing. I get my service, the attitude of servant from my mom. My mom still is in this community, right? In Hendersonville, she served on the Board of Education when I was in high school, so I had to walk the straight and narrow. <laughs> and go to, go to my website, ericgash.com, and look at the, my education policy. It was just uh, released today, and that will give you a comprehensive look. So go ahead and check that out, but I'll still talk to you afterwards about other questions that you may have. But she served, she presently serves on the Blue Ridge Community College Board of Trustees, the Salvation Army Board of Trustees. She's taken cakes and pies by people. She continues to serve. She works in a memory care facility and taking care of folks younger than her. But she has a service heart because it's about serving others and not being served. The second thing that came up in, 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 my, in my quest for this is about building bridges. First time ever in Hendersonville, we had a, there was a march, uh, a solidarity march, and, but our community was on the brink, like so many other small towns and communities around the country, were on the brink of division, on the brink of, man, just, uh, j just a spark away from something igniting. And so I was asked to speak at our first rally. And I had an opportunity. I could have either gotten up and spoken from a place of Forget about the police. We need to do this. We need to, we need to riot. We need to do all these things. I did not do that. I stood up, and I took that opportunity to bridge the gap. 
to build those bridges, not just with our law enforcement, first responders. The rally took place at the police department. We had to walk to the courthouse. And I'll tell you about two groups of people that I saw along the route. One, I affectionately called them the long gun posse. They had long guns and they're dressed in fatigues from head to toe. And we walked by them and I had, I had visions of, of, of Wallace and, uh, down in the segregated uh, South. And I thought to myself, why are you there? I saw somebody standing with them that I knew. And I called them later that day. And I said, hey, I want to talk to these guys. He says, all right, we'll set it up. On that Tuesday following that march, Myself and a few guys from church, we were sitting in their gun shop. And I said, hey guys, how you doing? My name is Eric Gash. This is who I am. This is what I do. This is what I'm about. This is why I was there. Who are you and why were you there? Come to find out, we had some things in common, right? They said, Eric, man, we heard that this was going to happen and that was, we, had, we had your back. The police and the sheriff knew that we were going to be there. And I said, wait a minute, you guys were there to do what? They said, we believe you, you should have uh, had the opportunity to speak and do what you wanted to do. We were there just to be a deterrent. And I said, you, wh what? Long short of it is a few of those folks, the gun owner, the, the, um, sorry, the guy that owns the shop, started coming to our church. He and his wife and a few guys, man, we fellowshiped together. See, I wasn't afraid that the, the things that we had in common, they too were concerned about jobs and the economy and health care. They too were concerned about the environment, clean water and fresh air for, for, for these beautiful mountains that we live in. They were concerned about those same things. We found that common ground. See, I didn't let our differences and my own prejudices keep me from reaching out to those guys. I'm not intimidated by them. Not at all am I intimidated by them. There was another group of folks. As we got down to the courthouse, they had on their motorcycle colors. And in the name was the word Confederate. So imagine kind of where that goes. And I said, you know what? I want to talk to them as well. See, I'm not intimidated. I'm not scared. So that Saturday, a week after the march, guess what? We had eight of them come to our church. And me and a, and a group of guys, we sat out and we had a conversation. And you know what I said? Hi, my name is Aaron. This is who I am. This is what I'm about. This is why I was there. Who are you? Why were you there? Right now, we didn't have as much in common <laughs> as, as you might imagine. But you know what? You know what we did have in common? They too wanted fresh air, <laughs> clean water. They were concerned about jobs and economy. So we found the common ground. I didn't let my preconceived notions, my prejudices, stop me from reaching out to them, reaching across that aisle. I know they don't believe like me or think like me or look like me, but we cannot allow that to keep us from having a conversation. Just because we don't agree on everything, it doesn't mean we can't sit down and have a civil conversation, break bread, have a meal together. We have been married for 25 years, been together for 26, and I can tell you we don't agree on everything. But I still love her, I still appreciate her, and we still sit down and eat, and we love and embrace each other. Why? Because that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to give people the benefit of their humanity. We have to, because we're all part of the same land. The third thing. I believe government needs to work for families, for working families, right? Now, I wanted to get to the question about law enforcement because I'm, as a police chaplain, I spent one week in Charlotte on a police uh, chaplain training program um, to where I could see behind the veil of law enforcement. And when I sit on ride-alongs and I go with these guys, we have honest conversations, and they say, Pastor Eric, listen, don't think less of me. I said, brother, that's why I'm here. Let's talk. So I saw behind the veil of law enforcement. I said, you need to see behind the veil of black America and brown America to see what we're going through as well. And so uh, as we're going to be here, <laughs> I, like I said, I'm going to preach. I've taken a long time. I, I want to connect with you, right? It's about us working together and building that broad coalition, and that's what I've been able to do. Folks across the aisle have reached out to me and says, Eric, I'm voting for you. I'm switching my affiliation. I met with a fire chief 
He says, I'm switching my affiliation, and I'm going to encourage other people to do it so that we can vote for you. Thank you for your time. Good evening. Thank you for having me here tonight. I really appreciate the chance to get to speak to y'all. So who am I? Well, my name's Jay Carey. Some of you may or may not know. I am the product of a working class family. My parents worked multiple jobs just to keep our family afloat. And when I turned 18, I joined the military, I joined the army, and I was continuing a long family tradition of service to this country, dating all the way back to the Revolutionary War. And I built a 20 plus year career and I retired as a Sergeant First Class. And I, while I was in, I deployed to multiple combat zones and I received a Bronze Star for my work in Iraq. And I'm a retired utility worker, married to my wonderful wife, Leslie. Together we have four boys ranging from 23 years old to two years old. So I will be kept on my toes for a very long time. We have four dogs, two cats. Uh, my 23 year old actually works in the same utility department that I worked in. Very proud of his work. He's doing great work for that city. So what brought me here tonight? Why am I running for Congress? Well, it's you. It's because of you, John. It's because of you, Crystal. Raymond. And even you, Wendy. I'm running for you, too. <laughs> even though I might be running against you sometime, I am running for you as well. What have we seen since we elected Joe Biden president? I'll tell you, we've seen over 300 million shots in arms. We have seen increased funding for our local hospitals, our schools, our EMS, our fire, and our police. And even though we're all sitting here masked, we are working and getting back to normal. We just got to continue getting those shots in those arms. Something I worked a little bit on today, making calls, and y'all should join in on that too. Just calling out people who haven't gotten shots and just asking them to go get them. So I believe that we can continue to build this nation, but only together. Together we can. So why should you vote for me? I'm not your typical politician. Far from it. Well, it's because of leadership, something we sorely lack in this district. Don't need to say any more names, we just lack it. Now, a, a good leader, a leader, a good leader definitely knows that they don't have all the answers. And I do not have all the answers. But I know how to bring the right people together and find those solutions to those complicated problems. Because none of these issues we face are simple. But they can be overcome, and they can be overcome together. So let me be clear. Together, we can build a more perfect union. Together, we can provide a living wage. Together, we can save this environment. Together, we can provide affordable health care and effective mental health care. So I firmly believe that together we can. I want you to say it with me. Together we can. 20 years out of tank, I don't hear so well. Y'all are gonna have to bring it up. One more time. Together we can. I'm Jay Carey and I'm asking for your vote. Thank you. And I'm gonna stay on the mic because I'm answering questions. All right. Pat. Yes, sir. I'm gonna answer your easy the first, I'm gonna take the easy one first. The military. No brainer. I support the military. 
I support veterans. I am both have been in the military and I am a veteran. My father is a veteran. My grandfathers are veterans. Okay, I 100% support the military in every endeavor, and we do need to fix our VA system for our veterans. One thing I hear when I talk to those people that work in that VA system when I go there is that they need better leadership. That's what they're asking for. They're not asking for more money. They're asking for better leadership, better systems, systems that make sense, not systems that don't work together. A nurse has one, a doctor has another, and a scheduler has another. That's what I'm hearing on your question about police. Defunding the police, completely wrong message, refunding the police. We need to refund, reallocate the funding for our police. Increase funding where it needs to be. Better training, more training. And we need to set up those special task forces to deal with those nonviolent instances where it more than likely is a mental health issue. I hope that answers your question. If not, please get with me afterwards. Any other questions? Yes, Wendy. As a fellow veteran, how would you uh, improve the VA system? And also on a side topic that's uh, with that, Cawthorn voted against uh, contraception for women in the VA system. Would you have voted for that? Well, of course you would vote against that, because that makes sense. <laughs> It makes sense to have it, it makes sense to provide it. Women's health issues in the VA are sorely lacking. This is what I'm told. I don't have firsthand knowledge of this, but I am told that are. you are lacking proper care. You don't have everything that you need to be fully seen at the VA, and that's, that's criminal. Our women serve right alongside with the men. There is no more separation. I led men and women in battle. Okay. The VA system, I don't have an answer on how to completely revamp it. I do know that it needs better leadership. We need to get the right people in the right faces, in the right place, and get them to implement the new systems that need to be in there. I don't have that expertise, but as a leader, I have tackled problems that I didn't fully understand with getting the right people together, listening to them, and coming up with those solutions, and then implementing them. Next question. Uh, Jay, um, our young voters want action on climate change, uh, recreational marijuana legislation, sensible gun legislation, and racial equality. First, do you agree with those wants? And uh, how will you attract high school, college, and 20-something to your campaign? Okay, that's a long question. That's a I feel like I'm back in Master Gunner School where it's a five-word question and a 500-word answer. All right, let's try climate change, Green New Deal. Excellent, excellent thing. This is what we need to do. Let's, let's talk about that real quick. 1955, we were 100 years away from, uh, from putting a man in space, putting a man on the moon. Within 15 years, by concentrating all our, all our, our willpower our knowledge, our experts on that problem, we put a man on the moon. I don't know how far we are from reaching all the, what the Green New Deal is trying to reach for, but if we concentrate ourselves, we concentrate all our experts, we put our money into it, we can reach those goals. We can reach them, I think, much quicker than most people think. Okay, marijuana, marijuana no problem, legalize it. Tough said, lots of money to be captured there. There's nothing wrong with marijuana. It's natural. When, yeah, no, wait, I gotta, let me finish these, okay. then I'll come back to you. Sensible gun legislation. Sensible gun legislation. Of course we need sensible gun laws. Who, would, who, who thinks that's not something that we need? Who? Who in their right mind thinks that we shouldn't fully vet gun owners? Ooh, that went quick. Madison, All right. Madison Cawthorn. Well, yeah. Uh, how about racial equality? And how are you gonna reach the high school and college students? I got a son in high school. Going to use him as a conduit for some of it. College students, I'm going to go out there. I'm going to get on those college campuses. I'm going to talk to those people. Because that's what I'm doing. I'm out there. I'm out in Cherokee County. I'm out in Graham. I'm out all the time. I'm going to get all the counties because I'm a retired disabled combat veteran. And my job is getting elected for Congress. 
Well, get off. Time up. The racial what is equality. That? Racial equality. I am not, one, one more thing that I am not an expert on. I was born a middle class white male. One of the most, uh, uh, one of the most uh, uh, luckiest people in the world here in America, I'll tell you what. But pay equity. Pay equity is a start. We need to pay people the same for the same work, regardless of who or what, sex, religion, whatever. That's it, pay it for you. You pay that person the same as you pay that person next to them. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Jake. Uh, folks, let's, yes. We have one question that everybody on Zoom wants oh. to ask. It's a quick fire for everybody. Go ahead. Uh, the question is, if you are not successful in the primary, will you fully support the winner? Jay, let's start with you. I believe a couple people on this panel can attest to the fact that I've already come up with them and said I would definitely support them. The bottom line is we need to get a Democrat in that seat. Yeah. I plan on winning, so yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, we're, all, we're all working for the same thing up here. And whoever makes it through the primary, that's the person that gets the support. 100%, absolutely. Democratic Party's put on. Uh, some phenomenal, talented, and qualified candidates, and they have my full support. To defeat Cawthorn, it's critical that the Democratic Party is united and sets a big, big tent for people to come into. So I'm ready to do the work every step of the way, and I'm planning for it to be me in the general. Yes, I plan on supporting and organizing around the winner, um, if that happens not to be Bo Hess. Well, um... Let's um, let's give them all a round of applause. Thank you. This, uh